Okay. All right, Sam. All right, we got a door. We had our we had our breakfast, and now we're heading into downtown. I'm gonna take you on Shoal Creek uh, Trail, and then try to make our way up to Shoal Creek Boulevard, and we'll have to come back. Great. So we're gonna go angle to the right up and down. onto that trail. Okay. Cool. There yeah, we go. Okay. That's the public library right there. I think the thing that is very, I don't know if tricky is the right word, or like living in Portland, we're pretty pot, we're pot committed to the Greenway network as our primary like bike network. Where like a city like Boston is gonna go protected bike lanes. And so I just don't think like in Portland, like the Greenway network like does it. Yeah. I just don't think you're going to get, you know, mass adoption with like the way they do it right now. Well, I wanted I want to show you this here. So, we we've been on the Shoal Creek Trail and we're here and this is one of many little connectors. And so, we see residences here. Um, our downtown REI shop is right over there and office buildings here. So, even this older trail is a legitimate utilitarian corridor, a commuting corridor and connector for folks. And so um, the Shoal Creek pathway here is all sort of curated by a nonprofit called the Shoal Creek Conservancy. Cool. And uh, they've been on the podcast before and, and you know we've kind of highlighted this area, but it is a, a critical you know utilitarian connector. So that's one of the key things, is that these things don't get turned into just recreation facilities. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's a key 
feature is to be able to take advantage whenever you have a right of way like this. Yeah. Like a old rail right, right away, a creek, you know, any kind of, any kind of, you know, utilitarian, u u utility corridor right. that you can do. And then the key is lots of connectivity to right. the entire street network. And just like in Portland, we have our challenge with the homeless yes. living along the trails. So that's another big challenge, a very, very difficult thing to deal with. Um, yeah, getting back to your comment on, you know, the, the challenge with the different types of facilities. Um, Going it's got to be both, yeah. you know, it's got to be those shared street as well as the others. Yeah. Ultimately, it's, it really does have to be both. It has right. to be. Protected and separated infrastructure yeah. along all roadways where speeds are more than 25 miles per hour, 20 miles per hour. Right. The reality is that the Dutch net network, the yeah. cycle network, 70% of the Dutch network is shared space. Yeah. Some form of 30 kilometer per hour. <laughs> um, quiet streets, shared right. space. Exactly what you're commenting about the the you know the greenways right that is the heart of the dutch network it's not what gets the attention what gets the attention is the separated and protected right. infrastructure and so when people ask and say well what's more important i'm like it's not what's more important you have to do them both yeah <laughs> and so when you look at you know in the portland example of every single one of those streets that are, are, um, yep. Every single one of those streets that is, is more of a urban connector. Yeah. You have to have all ages and abilities facilities in addition to all of the connectors that are the neighborhood greenways. The good news is, is that Traffic calming and neighborhood greenways can be done much faster, much cheaper uh -huh. than you can do protected and separated infrastructure. That's true. Where, whereas a build out of like say sidewalks and protected infrastructure might be billions of dollars yeah. and many, many decades of doing it unless you get a city to actually commit to stop building roads. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> let's turn left here. Right.
right, Sam, what do you think? This is lovely. This is lovely, isn't it? Yeah, this is great. Watch out for the yeah. uh, low tree here. So again, um, all of this trail will eventually be redone to be um, the highest standard of all ages and abilities uh, facility. So all this will get repaved and be wider. Uh -huh. um, it's just a matter of time and money. We'll come up to a few segments where you'll see some of the newer infrastructure and you'll see what the what it'll all look like eventually. Right. It is a historic trail. It's been here for many, many decades um, and uh, frequently gets washed out by flash floods that come through here. And speaking of which, the trail is blocked up ahead. So we're gonna veer to the left and get up onto the sidewalk and do a little detour. Why is it blocked up ahead? Landslide. Huh. Head left here. Sorry about that. Oh, we're on the other side. So that's what the new stuff looks like. This is brand new wayfinding. On your left. Thank you.
So again, you can see much of this trail needs to be redone. Um, and it will be eventually. Unfortunately, it'll probably have to go through various stages of environmental review to make sure that whatever they do doesn't make any situations worse, including flood, but clearly needs to be redone. Right. Protected bike lanes by the schools. How long have those have those been there? Years. Years. Yeah. The one by the second school installed very soon after we moved here, and the other one was already installed nine years ago when we came here. Oh, the first one's been there longer. Yeah. Oh wow. It's just it's going through a an incremental stage uh -huh. because now they've changed the, the dimensions of it and the angles of it and uh, and so now they need to go in and uh, gradually get to the point of um, you know get the the concrete work in there right and it's not it's it's nowhere near as easy as we all think it should be I mean I mean, they literally have 50 years backlog on concrete work and neighborhoods that have no sidewalks. Right. Let alone going back and fixing the ones that were built in the 1960s. Yeah. <laughs> you know. This is the beginning of the Shoal Creek Boulevard treatment. This is an on-street version of the trail. Uh -huh. And so this is a pilot project 
a temporary pilot project past the school. So again, put your school hat on. Okay. We're going to be going past the school. Great. John, how wide do you think this is? This is all the way to the curb, including the gutter pan, probably eight feet. It used to be the parking. They took the parking away from the curb. Wow, right by a school too? That's okay, wild. here's your school. Is this a private school? Yep. That was cool. All right, so thoughts. Yes, that was a private school. Yeah, that was a private school. Um, I really liked it. I thought that was a really, uh, you know, smart, simple way to create space for people walking and biking. Yep, we're turning right here, uh, by the way. I think what's interesting is I'm sure the school, you know, initially was, you know, there's some people that probably weren't excited about the loss of parking. So what I think the thing we forget is, you know, parking for schools, for parks is, it's a limited amount of space. So mm -hmm. if you don't get one of those close parking spots, now you're, now you're gonna have to navigate a more treacherous, you know, experience yeah getting to the school picking up your kid while you know this remove or you know we'll pull off for a second here while it removes a certain amount of spots yeah you're creating more options and it benefits people who also have to drive and you know you park and now you have a nicer experience walking yeah which you would have had to do anyways yeah Again, we, here's our wayfinding here of the trail network. 
So you have a little bit, this is brand new signage that just went in. And uh, so this is the Shoal Creek Boulevard. This is a recent installation over the last couple of three or four years. And um, it, it's an example of, you know, 10, 12 years ago, they tried to get a, a protected bike lane in here and they couldn't get it. You know, too much outcry from yeah. the neighborhood. And so the, the road was back up for resurfacing again. And so they tried again went through all the open houses. There were so many kids and families in this neighborhood that they were able to finally get it in. And so we won't be able to ride the whole thing. We're gonna run out of time, but yeah. we'll be able to get a little bit of it in. And so you'll have a little bit of a, a feel of, you know, what kids are now able to use to be able to get to some of the other public schools in this neighborhood. Absolutely. So. Pretty interesting that I'm seeing like a couple articles about recently is like, how the rate of children learning, like getting their driver's license mm -hmm. is drastically going down. Right. And it's sort of this thing where it's like, you know, car culture is almost like eating itself, where it's like <laughs> we are, shel we created so much car dominance yeah. that parents are sheltering their kids so much yeah. that they're too scared or unable to, you know, be comfortable to learn how to drive, you know? So it's this sure. thing where it's like, we have to scaffold in children's independence or else they're going to be too worried about the world and too sheltered from it to do the thing that has created them, you know, not to be able to, you know, get a driver's license. That or the kids are just freaking tired of cars and sitting in cars all the time. Exactly. You know, <laughs> it's a. Uh, I don't know. I think it's going to be really interesting to see. Yeah. But I mean, it's like at some point we're going to need to make that connection between children, independence, autonomy. How do we scaffold it in the age of you know? car dominance, you know, yeah. where cars are so massive and roads are unsafe and parents want to protect their kids. But you've taken away all of the, you know, development for children to be independent. Right. That ability. Yeah. So you can start to see some of the additional infrastructure not just bike you can see yeah we've got our pedestrian crossings i think that's just like something that i've really noticed in portland like in my neighborhood association meetings how like zero sum it is you know how it's like bike infrastructure doesn't help me as a driver you know, this is only inconveniencing me. It's partly our fault of having not done a well enough job as advocates to communicate that it's not about bike infrastructure. It's about creating livable communities infrastructure right. that is good for everybody, including drivers. And, and that's... I don't know if that's... It's tough. I mean... We, we get into a trap of talking bike, 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 where, you know, I try to encourage folks to talk in terms of, you know, we're talking about all ages and abilities of facilities that yeah. will be good for everybody. But I think it's, you know, it, from what I see in Portland is like, it's presented by the city in that way often. You know, and so you sort of like get trapped in the language of how the city's presenting it. And then like, you know, your neighbors know how you like to get around. Right. So they all know I ride my cargo bike. Right. So clearly I like bike infrastructure, but like I'll be in a meeting and I'll just be talking about walkability yeah. and community cohesion. Right. And then, you know, people will be like, not everybody can ride around in a cargo bike. And I'm like, not everybody can drive, and I didn't say anything about my cargo bike. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, I'm just talking about more livable communities. Yeah. 
And like, I haven't seen any research that says making it easier for people to drive and park adds to, you know, community cohesion. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, I think that the key challenge oftentimes is, is we get so wrapped up. Oh, cool. This is wayfinding right here in the residential area. I love it. Um, we get so wrapped up into fighting for our cause right that we get ourselves into entrenched into tribes right and then it becomes an othering discussion is that a slip lane for cars right there <laughs> yeah one that didn't get ripped out yeah i'll show you a slip lane that did get ripped out oh cool um but we get you know what i'm saying is we get into these tribes right and then it becomes an us versus them fight totally and we have to get away from that and partly the way i think that we have to get out of that is is to stop having these discussions about it being about the bike lanes it should be about you know creating livable communities and part of that is the following yeah now right ahead of you and to the right more lanes this equals see, more see this to the right yeah so oh, that yeah. used to be a slip lane now it's a rain garden i love it I love that. And there's a fun bridge. And there's a fun bridge. And so partly that rain garden got done because the Shoal Creek Conservancy is also concerned with water quality of the creek. Right. And so anything that we can do to depave and have more rain garden effect. Right. And so we suddenly have you know, a water quality creek conservancy that's advocating for this bike lane and depaving of some slip lanes. Yeah. So <laughs> that's an example of, you know, making our tent as broad as we can and not having it be a fight that is the bike people against everybody else. Absolutely. I know I, I was presenting in a uh, NACTO like streets for kids, uh, like school streets pandemic response comp uh, webinar. And a guy from Hawaii who was presenting was talking about how he partners with pickleball groups. Yeah. Because streets are a great place to play pickleball and pickleball courts are hard to come by. Right. And you know, it's like, it's a great way to engage a group of people, uh, you know, to make them more people focused and community oriented. Right, yeah. Now we rolled through a really cool protected intersection there. We didn't, we were deep in conversation, oh, yeah. so we didn't talk about it. But we've got another one right up here. So you'll notice they did come in and, and get the, the concrete poured and get this, you know, hardened up. Again, making the crossing shorter. Is there something, does it have like a camera on us or just when the yeah. light changes it will? Yeah, see the little camera right on the yeah. top? So right on the top of the signal, the bike signal, you've got the camera, it's right up there. And uh, yeah, you can also see the kids have uh, decided to paint the little concrete turtles I know, Multiple I love that. Colors. I'm going to get some photos of that. <laughs> Multiple colors. Nice and fun and whimsical. So we're getting by my house in Portland, we're getting a, a multi-use lane, basically this. Yeah. By the park. Yeah. And I think a fair response is we're gonna have a whole bunch of flex posts that's not gonna look totally aesthetically pleasing. Right. And so I wonder if these like domes are a little bit nicer. A little bit, yeah. I think, you know, a combination of these and those planters and yeah. other types of things. I'm not a huge fan of flexi posts. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm of the mindset that if you're going to put something in that's vertical like this, yeah. that it has the likelihood or the possibility of taking out a person on a bike, go ahead and put in a real bollard that'll stop a car yeah. <laughs> or really damage it. These, the car can go right over and right. there's zero damage. So, I know it's such a like, but here's a really good look at uh, the narrowness of the crossing, yeah. pedestrian crossing. Adds a little chicane-ish to it. Yep. Yep. I mean, and you can see the concrete work, the new concrete work that got done to finish it off. So that was part of what sold this project is to not present it as a bike project. Yeah. This was a Vision Zero and a community livability project. Yeah. Lower the speeds. There's too many fast moving cars through this area. Yeah. And so, you know, that's, I, I drive through this occasionally yeah. and- Wait, you drive a car? Occasionally, occasionally. Oh my God. I drive it occasionally. But it's very, um, it's very comfortable driving in this, this narrowed lane. Yeah. Comfortably at 20, 25 miles per hour. Definitely. I don't feel comfortable going any faster, which is the whole point. Absolutely. But this is part of, what will be when it's completed i think a 13 mile stretch this is great it's this thing like as a phys ed teacher this is like something i would put in my book or something it's yeah. like spatial awareness is not a skill like boundaries is yeah. not a mastered skill until like second grade yeah you know so like the fear of kids running into the streets is totally developmentally appropriate. Right. And so when you have something like this or, you know, slowing down cars, you're just creating more time and space for kids to do what children do, which is make mis which we all do, which is making mistakes is how we learn. Right. But, you know, with our infrastructure and how we've built our cities and towns, a mistake can be a child's life really quickly. Right. Yeah. And so we put that onus of safety on parents to have to, you know, be hyper vigilant. And if you look away for a second and your kid runs in the street chasing a ball, well, that was the parent's fault. Right. Yeah. You know, and similarly, like children learning to ride bikes, they need space to do the wobbles and to make mistakes and sidewalks, you know, which is pretty much in neighborhoods, the only car-free space is a very limited amount of space to make mistakes. Right, right. You know, and the kid who does a little wobble, they're either in the grass or they're falling in the street. So you have like the parent running behind them to shield them from, you know, rolling into the street where like something like this provides a lot more space. Yeah. You know, it gives them that ability to make some wobbles, some errors. Yeah, yeah. And still be able to like gain that confidence. Right, yeah. And that's exactly what we see is we see, you know, lots of kids with their parents, you know, using this on a daily basis to get to school and to the park. And, you know, on the weekends, even doing you know, longer distance trips. Yeah. It's just, yeah, this is, this is why we do what we do. Absolutely. You know, I think it is interesting, like, even with this infrastructure, kids and families still need help, like, learning how to use it and build confidence using it. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it is this thing, like we said earlier, like, the goal of the bike bus is for the bike bus not to exist. Right. But like, even if, you know, even the schools that we saw that have protected bike lanes, miles on either direction, yeah. still only had a handful of bikes in front. Right. You know, so it sort of leads us to think that like, there still is work to be done. Oh yeah. To support or to help build the confidence to use it. Yeah. Yeah, I said in another way, this is just the beginning. There's still a lot of work to be done. Yeah. Yeah. You know, getting the infrastructure is not 
I think sometimes they say like, oh, put your, you know, your energy into the infrastructure, not into like walking school buses or bike buses, because the infrastructure will yield the, you know, the movement will yield the like shift change, mode shift change. Yeah. yeah and it's it's like we were saying earlier, it's gotta be both. Yeah. It can't be one or the other. It's gotta be both. If you build your infrastructure, Congratulations, that's step one. <laughs> yeah, you've, you've removed a ginormous barrier, Yeah, but you still have 70 years of people not knowing what to do with it. A cultural barrier. Yeah, yeah. you have the cultural barrier. That's yeah. a nice way of putting it. And so you got to work to, uh, you know, change that behavior as well. Yeah. All right, all right. I think we have to pull the plug on going all the way up. Okay. Let's just do a U-turn up here. Right. 